we don't need a financial reset for precious metals and precious metals markets to do well. The market share, as we've discussed before, of precious metals related investments is less than one half of 1% in the total savings and investment matrix in the United States. If we merely return to the three decade mean, which is between one and a half and 2%, in other words, if we didn't win the war against the dollar, we just lost it last badly, um, you would see a phenomenal flow of funds into precious metals, which is what I think is gonna happen. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest you're sure to recognize. This is Rick Rule. He's the CEO of Sprott Asset Management. He joins us this Thursday, October 29, 2020. Rick, thanks for coming back on. Always a pleasure, Dunnigan. Thank you for having me back. Our viewers never fail to surprise me with how many questions they submit to us ahead of your arrivals here, and today is no exception. We wanted to get your seasoned view of the precious metals markets as we approach the U.S. presidential election and a fourth quarter that has, for a lot of people, brought trepidation of, are we going to get a second wave of a virus? Are we going to get more lockdowns? Are we going to have uh, civil unrest related to the outcome, no matter which way the election goes? And uh, people are, have a bit of anxiety in every direction, but wondering what your view is, maybe from a calmer standpoint, uh, and looking at it from a metals perspective. Well, you've asked a lot of questions rolled into one. Uh, with regards to the virus, I'm not an epidemiologist or anything like that. So the truth is I have no earthly idea. Uh, as a 67-year-old with prior autoimmune challenges uh, and as a curmudgeon, uh, I'm taking a lot of precaution, uh, staying out of harm's way to the extent I can. And Other people will need to make up their own mind as to what precautions they take and how to deal with that. With regards to the markets, uh, it would appear from the polls uh, that a Biden election is likely, uh, although the polls lied last time around, so who knows. I suspect the Biden election, election, particularly if there was a Democratic suite of the House and Senate, would be bad for financial markets in the near term. Uh, I suspect that the, uh, the Democrats' campaign promises, I'm not sure they'd keep them, but the Democrat campaign conferences around things like wealth taxes, uh, increased uh, income taxes, increased corporate taxes, stock transfer taxes, uh, that isn't a recipe for a strong equity market. Uh, and so in terms of my general market securities purchases and my oil and gas equities purchases, which I'm eager to do, I'm postponing them till after the election. Uh, I believe that the upside in general market equities, uh, the near term upside is low in any circumstance. Uh, and I believe uh, that the possibility of substantial downside as a consequence of people freaking out uh, about a Biden sweep would be high. So I don't see much pain involved in postponing a decision, and I see some potential gain in postponing a decision. My own view, as I've expressed to you and your audience in the past, has been with regards to precious metals, uh, irrespective of which major party dominates the executive and the legislative branch, uh, they both seem committed to destroying the purchasing power of your savings and mine, uh, which means that both parties, sadly, will be good for gold. Uh, I, I don't see either party uh, reducing quantitative easing. The idea that you can spend money that you don't have to borrow or tax uh, strikes both of them as being a lot of fun, but it's not good for the dollar. I don't see either party being interested in cutting government spending or the debt or deficits. I don't see either support either party supporting free market interest rates. So I see negative interest rates con uh, continuing. So in sum, while I think it's very bad for the country, uh, I, I think a country under Republican leadership or Democratic leadership uh, offers much more of the same, which while bad for the country is good for precious metals. Uh, I would note, too, in your discussion of the markets, that the last time that you and I visited, uh, I noted that the very small end, the microcap juniors, seemed to me to be overheated and overpriced. I'm delighted to say that that sector has fallen 
you know, 20, 25%. And some of the valuation problems I was seeing there, I was seeing there have gone away. We are still overheated, uh, as is evidenced by uh, the private placement financing market, uh, where companies that I believe are valueless are raising $20 million without a sweat. So I'm not seeing very much private placement traffic that attracts me. But I am seeing circumstances where there was companies that uh, I wanted to buy in the aftermarket and I would have bought, say, for the fact that they were unattractively priced. And the market has accommodated me in that regard. I'm seeing much less pressure uh, in that sector of the market. So I'm encouraged about that. This uh, question, I think, will flow into what you just described um, Rick Rule, uh, the most consummate analyst on YouTube, he starts. Can Rick delineate for us between major miners versus juniors versus exploration stocks and when to hold royalty stocks, all within the context of up and down moving price of gold and as it relates to risk? So that's a multi-dimensional, I think a three-dimensional chessboard there, but in general, in broad terms, with gold price and risk as your X and Y axes, can you give us kind of your overview of those different categories of mining companies? That's an hour-long discussion, so I'll paraphrase most of it. For most investors, generalist investors, who believe the precious metals thesis, they are better off in the very, very large companies, not even buying an ETF, not even buying an index, but rather buying five or six of the highest quality, most liquid stocks and calling it a day. The truth is in a bull market, a gold bull market, uh, merely capturing the, the beta is sufficient. You don't need to outperform the market because the market will give you five or six hundred percent over time. So for most investors, uh, twenty-five billion dollar market cap and above, uh, investment grade rated balance sheet, uh, strong income statement, strong operating margins are where they ought to be. Mostly people like that aren't interested enough in the sector to listen to your broadcast. They want better, more specific advice. Um, I call those big ones the best of the best. And then there's the best of the rest, uh, which is to say maybe multi-asset producers, but not investment grade. Maybe market capitalizations between five and $15 billion. Um, they are currently cheaper than the best of the best, and they deserve to be. <laughs> because they have more risks associated with them. Coming down from that, you have single asset producers. Single asset producers, uh, again, are cheaper than the top two categories because, again, they have one source of income, often in a politically challenged place. Uh, you know, there's a whole gradation all, all the way down. You, you can go from there to the developers, people who don't have a project in production, but they have a project that looks very much like it will go into production. Maybe the financing has been secured. Maybe they're working on a bankable feasibility study. Below that, you have advanced exploration, and then you go all the way down into the exploration companies. What was odd about this market that we talked about in the last time I was on with you was the fact that market leadership went from the best of the best, they moved first as they should, all the way to the little tiddly exploration juniors, the narrative stocks. I suspect that that's the, um, the impact of social media and the sort of Robin Hood investors, uh, because it doesn't take a lot of mind to move those markets. Uh, and the younger Robin Hood uh, style speculators are much more narrative oriented because they don't yet have the education uh, to move up the quality trail. So it's been an interesting market. But we certainly see a circumstance now where the middle part of the market, which hasn't moved, uh, the single asset producers, the best of the rest, the advanced developers, people like that, are in the historical context cheap. Uh, and either they be, well, one of three things happens, uh, the gold price falls, which I don't think will happen and they'll no longer seem cheap <laughs> or, uh, value oriented buyers will buy them or they'll be taken over by larger companies who have a lower cost of capital, uh, a fairly virtuous circle from my viewpoint. I feel really good about the middle part of the market. Uh, I guess the second thing I'd like to say to that, uh, questioner is that it's absolutely critical, I think, that he or she study the anatomy of past bull markets in precious metals. I always refer, Donegan, as you know, to the Barron's 50-year 50 50 -year chart. But it's important to note that even in a secular bull market where the gold mining indexes increase 500 or 600%, there are frequent 20 or 25% declines 
it's important to right size one's investment relative to somebody's tolerance for volatility and relative to somebody's tolerance for risk. The gold narrative is so powerful to the upside that when people adopt it, they often don't believe that there's a possibility of a downside. And a downside that's fairly modest in the context of history can often shake people out of positions to their detriment, where if they had prepared themselves psychologically by studying the anatomy of prior bull markets, uh, they'd make much, much, much more money. Interesting. Ah, I wish we had the hour to hear the hour version of that, but thank you for the, the, the abridged version. Uh, we have a question for Keystone Stacker, and this one is similar to ones that's come up before. You usually preface your answer by saying, I don't give individualized investment advice. I don't know enough about this, this person and their whole situation. And yet I'm going to ask the question anyway. And they're just giving it because they're, they're talking in general. They said, this is Keystone Stacker. said, Rick, if you were to uh, give advice to a working class person making, say, $50,000 a year, is there any hope for them to preserve some wealth for their family? So and he goes on and on talking about the, the situation of life. I think he's just trying to say average, uh, average American household. The, aver- the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, first of all, um, we're going to get through this. It, it ain't going to be pretty. There's going to be a reckoning. But we're going to get through this. I remember myself getting through the, de- the latter part of the decade of the 60s when there was civil unrest, when there was the war in Vietnam, when there was even more uh, racial ferment than there is today. And I remember because I was a young person and hadn't experienced this, it was very dramatic. And I talked about my view of the future with my grandfather. And he sort of looked at me and laughed and said, you know, my generation went through some stuff too. The Depression, World War II, <laughs> all of this will pass. So, uh, you know, understand that. Don't be looking to collective solutions for individual problems. Don't be looking to the government to get you through or solve your problems. It's important that people, irrespective of their means, save. It's important to save. Uh, Consider savings not to be something that you do with excess cash, but rather the first bill you pay. Before you get a Starbucks, before you get a beer, before your wife gets a flower, 10% 10% of every paycheck pre-tax gets saved. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you do that, and if you continue to invest in yourself, in your own education, and in your job, if you focus on delivering value rather than on getting paid, you'll get through this just fine. Uh, it's just those are very difficult things to do. Most people in the United States, I think, um, want to live rich, but they don't want to be rich. Uh, And early on in the process, those are two different things. Uh, You must scale back on your acquisition of consumer goods and services in order to build up the capital to take care of your family. Over time, your capital begins to work for you and you need to work less hard. So uh, in answer to the gentleman's question, uh, this is still the greatest country on earth. It's not as great perhaps as it was and not as great as it's going to be. And I think that we're going to we're going to have a reckoning that's going to be tough to get through, but we're going to get through it. Uh, There's no point in using the political and social dilemmas that are in front of us as an excuse to fail. It's much more important to focus on what you can do for yourself, whatever your job is, do it better. Uh, and do it in a way where you focus on delivering value for others. If you deliver value for others, they're going to find a way to pay you. Interesting. I mean, you've spoken with us in the past about that concept of preparing yourself to be able to take advantage of opportunities rather than being taken advantage of them. And that part of that has to do with that liquidity and that balance that you build up through that habit of savings. Um, the thought that occurred to me when you're talking about that, it sounds a lot like some of the advice from the, the little booklet, uh, Richest Man in Babylon. I don't know if you, if, if you recommend it's that. Wonderful, paper. wonderful book. Wonderful book. Uh, here's the flip side of a, a coin we've talked about. Erarium Stabulum says, Mr. Rule, can you explain the hallmarks of poorly run mining companies and the indicators of a mining company that is likely to fail? Sure. Uh, we did a random survey about 10 years ago now of 25 
uh, mineral exploration companies, juniors, uh, with market capitalizations. I think it was below $50 million on the Toronto Stock Exchange. <clears throat> and we found that the median company spent more money on general and administrative expense than they did on exploration, which is to say they were actually compensation machines. Uh, the level of general and administrative uh, or non-project expense to project expense is probably the single key determinant of success in the mining business. Uh, my nomination, this isn't investment advice, this is illustrative. My nomination for the finest gold mining company in the world is Franco Nevada, which isn't really a mining company. They're a royalty company. And they're my nomination for this because they have the highest operating margins in the business. And importantly, the lowest management expense ratio of any publicly traded major mining company. <laughs> so the first determinant really, I think, is the level of expenditure on general and administrative or non-project expenses relative to others. It really truly starts with people. Uh, if you get that part right, the rest of it falls into line fairly quickly. Uh, I could answer the question in more detail, but then the questioner would need to break down for me the type of mining company that he or she is interested in. Uh, but let me just say management expense ratio is the easiest screening tool uh, to determine whether or not the uh, officers and directors are on your side or against you. Uh, this gets to your question, the next one, about how you often offer to do rankings of people's uh, precious metals portfolios, or excuse me, natural resource portfolios. So maybe we should go ahead and just get that out of the way first before I ask the question. Um, are you still in the business of ranking people's portfolios? Absolutely. We've got the process almost automated. You're now. incurable. So, okay. So go we're ahead. turning these we're turning these things around much more quickly. Okay. Um, that's damning us by faint praise, of course, given how far behind we got for a time. Um, yes, absolutely. If any of your listeners would like to know more about what I think of their individual portfolio, I'm happy to tell them. They can go to a website, sproutusa.com forward slash rankings. There they will find a drop down uh, web form with 1300 companies on it. Uh, and if they enter uh, their uh, natural resource companies, please no cannabis companies, no banks, no supermarkets, just resource companies. Uh, I will rank those companies one through 10, provided I know them. Uh, and I will add comments on an individual company basis where I believe my comments might have value. In addition to that, if you uh, ask for charts, that's all you have to say is charts, I will include the 50-year Barron's Gold Mining Index chart and a 100-year commodity chart, not because uh, I purport to know anything at all about technical analysis, but rather because these charts are the most impressive visual tools I have uh, with regard to the anatomy of bull markets and bear markets, commodity markets in general, and in particular, precious metals equities markets. Yes, we're still doing it. Uh, yes, we update the uh, rankings continually based on news. It's an amazing chore, uh, but it's also an amazing service. The outpouring of sort of love that we have got from speculators uh, has been really, truly gratifying. It's probably the single most pleasant activity I've engaged in in a 45-year business career. And it's a great service to our viewers, so we really appreciate it. And folks, that's completely uh, free to you to take advantage of that. Um, we've got a now a question related to that because you didn't mention now, but you've mentioned in the past how you have this 1 to 10 scale where it's very, very, very difficult, the stringent criteria to get a 1 in your in your scale, but but uh, other ones are easier to get. The question from Acme Corporation says, referring to your resource personal ranking, what is the typical resource investor's profile? I'm wondering what interesting features you have discovered analyzing the collected data. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one thing I would note is that, and perhaps it's because of the forums that I appear in, the average portfolio that we have ranked is far too speculative. And the average portfolio has far too many names. Uh, I suspect that speculators have tried to limit risk with diversity. The difficulty is not knowing enough uh, about the companies that they invest in, 
diversity actually increases rather than reduces risk. Uh, I, I think that uh, investors have a, an interesting thematic sense of natural resources. You'll see investors almost self-segregate themselves into uranium speculators or silver speculators or gold bugs. Uh, but the application of the narrative and stock selection uh, often doesn't match. Uh, I, I think, too, that my continued admonishment to buy market beta before you try for alpha is broadly ignored. Um, I think it's less fun to invest than it is to speculate. <laughs> That's the only thing I can think of. Well, both you and Doug Casey, who ruin us that way because you remind us that what we should be doing to be responsible and everything is to, is to be doing it in the other order. And then you say, but that's Chris, not how I, how I made my money. <laughs> so it's like a... Well, you know, when I think back at the risks I took, uh, I'm leery about recommending that course of action to yeah. somebody else. And Dunnigan, it's important to note that unlike me, most people have lives. Um, I do this all the time. I do it seven days a week. I do it 12 to 14 hours a day. The idea that as an example, a very competent plumber or doctor could compete with me when he or she devotes two hours a week mm -hmm. and I devote 70 or 80 hours a week. Uh, what works for me is uh, a function of the amount of work I'm willing to put in. I've told people that speculators should the number of stocks a speculator owns should correspond with the number of hours per month they're willing to spend on their portfolio. I may very well spend uh, 300 hours a month. Now, I'm not going to own anywhere near 300 stocks, but the idea that somebody whose main focus in their professional life is medicine or plumbing or something else uh, is going to be able to afford to be as speculative as I am is uh, either – uh, means that they hold an extremely low opinion of my intellect and work ethic, <laughs> or they have a very inflated uh, picture of their own competence for a part-time avocation. Uh, back to the question of uh, some of the rankings that you've done uh, or the sectors of different companies that people should be considering. Uh, JP asks, along the lines uh, of this, I've recently heard someone state that it's not a good time to buy royalty companies because of, we're in a rising precious metals market. That doesn't make sense to me. Rick has previously spoken about loving the optionality companies as well. I would appreciate his thoughts on the royalty companies versus relative precious metals market timing and the precious metal market cycle. The royalty companies are so efficient that ironically they have less upside associated with higher prices because they're already high margin businesses. If you're Franco Nevada and you enjoy an 85% operating margin at $1,800 gold, uh, at $2,200 gold, you're going to enjoy an 87 or 88% operating margin. If by contrast, you are a $1,500 an ounce cash cost producer, you're currently enjoying a $300 margin at $1,800 gold and the price of gold goes to $2,300 or $2,400, your margin doubles. Mm -hmm. So ironically, the least efficient companies offer the most upside, but they offer the most downside. Uh, for me, the upside associated with the market beta, which is to say the upside that uh, a composite of big companies gives you in a bull market is so extraordinary that most people don't need to take much risk. In other words, most people don't need to outperform it. They just need to capture it. So, I believe that if you take away most of my downside, you can take away some of my upside, and I'm happy with that trade. It doesn't mean that with some of your portfolio, you shouldn't swing for the fences. I did, and I do. That brings you to optionality companies. Optionality companies are companies with very large resources. Uh, I don't say reserves because reserves is an economic term. It suggests that they're economic at this price point. Very large resources. Resources that could become wildly economic at a higher price point, but because they aren't economic now, have a constrained market capitalization. Think of them as options on options. Mm -hmm. um, 
This sector of the market was free in the 1990s. Nobody cared about it because the gold price had fallen so far from 1981 to 1990. And we were able to build portfolios of optionality plays and, in fact, optionality projects because nobody understood that in a rising gold market, these things might come back. The difficulty with the optionality plays today is that some of them, uh, Nova Gold, by, run by a very smart guy, very good friend of mine, uh, huge optionality, unbelievable optionality, high capital cost, uh, difficult to build in this environment. But importantly, uh, a market capitalization in the billions. It's no longer free. Now, if we get $3,000 gold or $4,000 gold or $5,000 gold, which I don't believe is unlikely, you'll make a lot of money in the optionality plays, including the Nova Golds and the Sea Bridges of the world. But understand the risks uh, associated with us not achieving those lofty goals with regard to the gold price or uh, of us achieving those goals four years from now or five years from now after you have lost patience with the theme. Mm -hmm. I see the analogy to options because you're just you're you're skimming the top off of that curve, but if it doesn't get there, you get nothing. Right. Okay. Uh, William Mueller says, please ask Rick to talk about Sprott Trust's specifically fully allocated gold and silver metal and safety from Canadian bank confiscation in contrast to SLV. Um, the difference between our products or physical products, which are structured as trusts, and all of the ETFs uh, uh, are twofold. Uh, the first is that for U.S. taxpayers, uh, the ETFs are taxed as gold surrogates, which is to say, to the extent that you enjoy capital gains, they're taxed at the collectibles or ordinary income rate, depending on your state, whereas the trusts are taxed at the capital gains rate. And from my point of view, paying less tax is both efficient and patriotic. Uh, the second question really goes to the security uh, of ownership. In the ETFs, their assets pinch and swell every day. They have to buy and sell, sell gold or silver, depending on whether they've had inflows of capital or outflows of capital. And they buy and sell uh, from one or more counterparties. In a circumstance where you had a sudden collapse in liquidity in the market, say a 2008 style event, the risk is in an ETF that some of your purchases wouldn't be physical, but rather they would be delivery or deposit receipts, which means that you could, in theory, become an unsecured creditor to a financial institution, a Deutsche Bank or a Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. I personally don't regard this as a big risk. I personally told Eric Sprott when we were constructing our products that I didn't see it as a big risk. And he said, yeah, I get that, but I'm the lead order for this. And I don't want to take any risk at all, uh, which is a very viable comment. Um, you know, if you're owning these things to protect yourself from risk, uh, maybe rather than accepting a little risk, you accept no risk. Now, with regards to confiscation, um, our gold and silver is stored at the Royal Canadian Mint. Could the Canadian government change their mind and say what was yours is now ours? The answer to that is yes, uh, but the truth is that that type of overt theft is very unpopular. Uh, the Canadian government can steal enough from Canadian taxpayers. The U.S. government can steal enough from U.S. taxpayers simply by raising the tax rate or by quantitative easing. Both of those measures are extremely popular. Overt theft, stealing your IRA, uh, stealing our gold and silver – is very unpopular, and it seems to me that politicians will always do the easy and popular thing, which is to say they'll steal it covertly rather than overtly. So is it a risk? Yes. Is it a risk that keeps me up at night? No. We've spoken with you in the past about other assets besides precious metals, including rare earth and other natural resources. Now, in the light of this year of 2020 with lockdowns and concerns about dependence on foreign supplies of different uh, key commodities for, for technological manufacturing, etc., there's been an increased concern about, about sovereignty of nations. J.R. says, Mr. Rule, Congress has been bilaterally cooperating on a bill that would reduce American dependence on China for rare earth metals. Do you have any commentary on this situation and or any suggestions about how to invest in the future of rare earths? 
rare earths are difficult to invest in because they're a very small asset class. The Chinese dominate the rare earths business because they're the lowest cost producers. There simply isn't a, an existent American source of supply that compete that could compete with the Chinese based on price. This circumstance is beginning to change a little bit in that uh, there is now enough wealth in China that the Chinese are unwilling to tolerate the ecological devastation, uh, which has occurred concurrent with their rare earth production. They are no longer such low cost producers because they aren't any longer willing to uh, accept the toxicity associated with heavy metals production in eastern China. What you learn about rare earths is that they're not particularly rare. They're between four and ten times as abundant of gold as gold, as an example, in the Earth's crust. They're rare because the Chinese have made them so cheap that it hasn't been worth anybody's while to go find them. But any place that you find the right geological environment, uh, that could be central Nevada, it could be the Canadian Shield, it could be Siberia, it could be Congo, it could be Brazil, uh, will uh, ultimately yield economic rare earth deposits. The United States has a very large rare earth deposit in Southern California called Mountain Pass. Uh, it's conveniently located on Highway 15, the major connector between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. The problem is uh, that it doesn't make any money uh, competing with the Chinese at today's rare earth prices. The, the president may decide that it's in American consumers' interest to make them pay more. Um, governments have made that type of decision before, certainly. Or the Chinese may decide to use rare earths uh, to you know, unilaterally punish other countries, in which case uh, they would drive a lot of exploration expenditure into rare earths and they'd lose their monopoly. Um, it's an interesting circumstance. For investors, it's a particularly fraught circumstance because you can't invest in the Chinese companies and any company that you can invest in which competes with the Chinese companies literally gets their butt kicked by the Chinese. So it's a, it's a lethal part of the world for an investor, probably okay for a speculator, a trader who, rather than worry too much about the fundamentals, understands the impact of a narrative on the psychology of a market. I'm not that person. Quick question. Well, this, maybe you'll have a quick answer for this one. Yusup Yat says, has Rick ever sold a stock at a loss and bought it back that before the 30-day wash sale period ends? And in general, does Rick think that precious metal speculators and investors devote too much or too little attention to tax consequences when deciding on trading stock positions? Uh, I have sold stocks and bought them back prior to the expiry of the wash trading rules, but never for tax purposes. That's happened on occasion where I sold a stock and I recognized later that I'd made a mistake, or where some news came out that caused me to value the company differently. Uh, I believe in tax loss sales. Uh, I believe in them for two reasons. One, uh, they're efficient financial planning but more importantly, when you sell a stock, uh, you can approach it with a very fresh point of view. If you own a stock, you always have a bias in favor of it. You might not want to sell it because you might not want to recognize your failure. If you sell a stock and you no longer own it, you can take a fresh look at it after 31 days, a, a look that's unconstrained by your own bias, psychology, and prejudice. Uh, so I... I am very often in my speculations uh, a tax-driven uh, speculator. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Tony Paracone says, uh, this is an opinion question, and you said you have a cracked crystal ball, so we'll go assuming that. How close in your gut do you feel we really are to the end of fiat and the SHTF moment? Uh, I don't think that fiat will ever end. Uh, I believe that there will be one or more semi-resets, but I suspect that the popular demand for fiat, uh, and fiat may become a distributed ledger style fiat, but the idea that the Commonwealth, that is whatever group of citizenry bands together, no matter how they choose to do it, 
the idea that the Commonwealth itself uh, wouldn't vote or, or, or wouldn't cause uh, a communally backed uh, financial system doesn't seem to me uh, to be in the offing, certainly in my lifetime. There will be some of us uh, who choose as much as they possibly can to opt out of it, which is to say that you transact in their currency, but you save in a different currency or in a different medium of exchange. Uh, I see a uh, I see a likely circumstance where a million or more Americans choose to store the majority of their liquidity in precious metals uh, and perhaps then transact in U.S. dollars or some other medium of exchange. But the idea that you see a total dollar collapse and, you know, the end of American financial markets as we see them, well, I, well, I see it as possible. I don't see it as probable. And it's important that people who have invested in gold and silver, not merely for fear, uh, but rather uh, out of greed uh, because of momentum, because they think these assets are going to increase in price. We don't need a financial reset for precious metals and precious metals markets to do well. The market share, as we've discussed before, of precious metals related investments is less than one half of 1% in the total savings and investment matrix in the United States, if we merely return to the three decade mean, which is between one and a half and 2%, in other words, if we didn't win the war against the dollar, we just lost it last badly, um, you would see a phenomenal flow of funds into precious metals, which is what I think is gonna happen. The last question will be the most difficult. Rodney Richardson says, what's your favorite ice cream? <laughs> Old fashioned peppermint. Peppermint. Old-fashioned so, peppermint. Old, it has, it has chunks to say old of, fashioned with, with chunks that has chunks of peppermint in it. Nice. Very nice. Uh, and, and not the diet kind. You know, I want you know, I want the kind that blows up your arteries and gives you diabetes. You just triggered a very fond childhood memory for me because the first hand cranked homemade ice cream I ever had was old fashioned peppermint. And nothing has ever matched that in my in my book as well. Yes, you were very here. well. Brought, you were very well brought up. Uh, and then just a comment, not a question. The very last last is Tony saying, "I voted Rick Rule on my ballot for president of the United States." So just so you know, there was a write-in vote for you on the on the ballot. If elected, I promise to demand an immediate recount. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, we always appreciate you joining us here. Our viewers, uh, if will be wise to take you up on your offer to for free rank their precious metals portfolio. Folks, look in the description of this video. Make sure you click like and subscribe and make sure you get on our free newsletter by going to libertyandfinance.com. But Rick, you've got to give people uh, another way if they want to get a hold of you and to find out more what Sprott has to offer. Uh, once again, the drop down is sproutusa.com front slash rankings. Uh, failing that, the easiest way to get hold of me is email me personally. That's our rule, R-R-U-L-E, at SprottGlobal.com. Uh, the rankings database will get you a quicker response, probably, if that's uh, possible. But uh, happy to have it either way. Well, thank you again for joining us, Rick. Always a pleasure, Dunnigan. Thank you. To acquire gold and silver, just go to libertyandfinance.com. When the main site comes up, click on Bullion Sales. That's libertyandfinance.com, Bullion Sales. You'll see my name, Donegan Kaiser, my phone number, and my associate, Kaiser Johnson, his phone number, our email, libertyandfinance at protonmail.com.